In this video, we're reviewing Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and showing you how to get webbed up with a sweet heat cocktail I've named the Venom Strike. Today on the Martini Shot. Hello and welcome to the Martini Shot, home of movie reviews and movie-themed cocktails. My name is Brandon. Before we get into the review, let's scour the multiverse for the best spider cocktail that I've named Venom Strike. And hey, if you enjoy movie reviews and movie-themed cocktails, be sure to leave a like and hit subscribe if you'd like to help support the channel. Miles Morales really has come a long way towards becoming a widely recognized and respected Spider-Man, so I wanted to honor him with a drink. The Venom Strike, named after an electrical ability that makes Morales unique to the original Spider-Man, utilizes the character's color palette of black and red with quite a few bites of flavor. The drink uses tequila alongside lemon juice for some tartness in addition to a little bit of hot sauce for just the right amount of heat. The drink is quite refreshing and great to look at, so let's not waste any more time and get right into it. So the first thing we're going to want to do to get started is to prep our glass. I'm going to be using a Collins glass for this, and we are going to be rimming the glass with some black sanding sugar. What this is going to do is add a nice little bit of sweetness around the rim, but it's also going to affect the color of the drink once we pour it into the glass. So go ahead and grab a lemon or lime wedge, drag it along the rim of the cocktail glass, and then you can start coating it in the black sanding sugar. So you can go ahead and coat the entire room if you want, or if you want to do a half room, you can also do that. I'm actually going to be leaving this upside down in the sugar while we're making the drink just to let the sugar sit for a little bit longer. Now that your glass is prepped, we can go ahead and start on the cocktail itself. So first we're going to start off with a little bit of grenadine. This is going to add some sweetness to the drink and push it more into that bright red direction that we're going for with the color. And you're going to be doing three fourths ounces. Next, let's bring in some of that heat with some hot sauce. I think Tabasco is usually a pretty good pick for any time you're adding hot sauce to a cocktail. And you can adjust this based on how hot you want it to be. I'm gonna go with three dashes. I think that gets you a good amount of heat without it being really overpowering. And now we're gonna be applying some juices, first starting with some lemon juice, and you're gonna be doing three fourths ounces. And for our next juice, we are gonna be using blood orange juice. Blood orange juice is a little bit more bitter than normal orange juice and it has a deeper redder color, which I think is going to fit quite well into this drink. And of course, if you can, do fresh squeezed blood orange juice. If you can't find any fresh blood oranges, you can definitely use the, the prepackaged variation. To my surprise, I was actually able to find some blood oranges. They're out of season currently, so I was a little shocked to find them in stores. But anyway, you're gonna be doing three fourths ounces. And now we can get into our alcohol, starting with some creme de cassis. I've used this a couple times on the show, but in case you don't know what this is, it's a black currant liqueur, a little sweet, a little bit on the rich side, usually good for an after dinner drink. But I think the sweetness and the color is gonna find a great home inside this cocktail. And like our other ingredients, you're gonna be doing three fourths ounces. And now for our main spirit, we're gonna be using tequila. Whenever I think of liquors that give quite a bite, tequila is always one of the first ones that come to my mind, so I think it fits pretty well in a drink called the Venom Strike. And I'm gonna be using this nice Reposado tequila I got from Mexico. And you're gonna be doing two ounces. All right, let's get ice in our shaker and shake the chill. All right, so now you can go ahead and throw some ice in our prepared glass. And this drink does involve soda water, so we're actually gonna be doing something a little bit different before we pour the cocktail into the glass. I'm gonna go ahead and pour just a little bit of soda water into the glass and then put the cocktail in and then top it up with more soda water. The reason I'm doing this is we're not really gonna wanna mix the cocktail once it's in the glass. It'll kind of throw off the color. So this way we can have the cocktail in between two layers of soda water just so it kind of mixes together so you're not just having one layer of soda water while the other layer is just the cocktail. And you can do this with a lot of other cocktails that call for soda water as well. So let's go ahead and get a little bit of soda water in there and now we can strain our cocktail. Cocktail. And now finally we can top it up with some more soda water and if you look closely you'll see as the soda water starts to touch the black sugar along the rim it'll start to drip adding a cool little visual effect as well as changing the color of the top of the cocktail. And there you go now you have the Venom Strike. 
the heat, the sweetness, even a little bit of bitterness, it all works really, really well together in this cocktail. The tequila definitely packs a punch and I think the hot sauce is a great pairing whenever you're doing anything with tequila. And the blood orange juice adds a little bit of bitterness, but it's also very refreshing, amplified by that soda water. The grenadine and the lemon juice also add a little bit of sweetness. And while the creme de cassis is a little bit understated, I can definitely point it out in there. There's a little bit of a rich sweetness that kind of lingers on your tongue after each sip. I think these flavor combinations definitely make it a little bit unique, but it's very approachable at the same time, especially if you like a drink with a little bit of a kick. And even with that heat, I feel like this is a great summer drink. Tequila just makes great summer drinks in general. And I will say with the black sanding sugar, it does get a little bit messy, especially if it starts to drip to the outside. So I would definitely lay a coaster down, maybe have some paper towels on hand. But hey, I really like the color contrast going on here. So I think it's worth it. Now that we have our drink, let's dive straight into the review of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Let me be upfront. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is a masterpiece. It's one of the best Spider-Man movies, one of the best superhero movies, and straight up just one of the best animated movies of all time, in my opinion. The film not only managed to do justice to one of the most beloved superheroes of all time, but it also managed to craft an animated experience that remains compelling and exciting, even if you only had the smallest inkling of Spider-Man's history. It's a gorgeous movie whose slower frame rate style of animation created a perfect translation of the comic book art style to screen, so much so that other films have started following suit. On top of that, it's hilarious, action-packed, emotional, and mature enough that any age can have a good time with it. It's rare I call a movie perfect, but this sure as hell comes close. But of course, perfection is often a lightning in a bottle, and having a follow-up film be anywhere close to the original is nothing short of a monumental task. Yet there's few producers I trust more than Phil Lord and Chris Miller, the brains behind some of the best comedy and animated films of the past decade. So I wasn't exactly as worried as I could have been. And goddamn, ladies and gentlemen, they've done it again. Across the Spider-Verse is absolutely phenomenal, building upon the groundwork of the original and going absolutely nuts with its style and story. While this may be yet another multiverse story, it's linked so closely to what makes Spider-Man a great hero that it manages to stand out among the films in its own lane and beyond. The cast is excellent, delivering both silly laughs and grounded emotional moments that better flesh out our main characters, while also bringing in a web of new supporting characters that range from impactful to blink and you'll miss it cameos. And of course, the animation is cranked up to 11, integrating a wide variety of new styles and techniques that gives each character, location, and scene its own identity while managing to stun you with the masterwork of skill on display here. At times, it may feel a bit overwhelming, and it does suffer slightly from being the first part of a two-part film, yet for a die-hard Spider-Man fan, I'm blown away in all the best ways. Across the Spider-Verse picks up a little over a year after we left Miles Morales, a newer Spider-Man still trying to find balance in his double life. The emergence of a time and space hopping supervillain called The Spot leads Miles to once again deal with the inhabitants of the multiverse, including old friends and an entire society of spider people, which puts him into conflict with their leader, a futuristic Spider-Man named Miguel O'Hara when Miles tries to do things outside of the Spider-Man way. The character work here is fantastic, both from a writing and acting standpoint. Shameik Moore's Miles Morales is still as endearing and relatable as ever, who's put into a lot of tough emotional spots as he adapts to being both a hero, a student, and a son. Miles' natural growth from the first film is definitely noticeable, and it's a blast to watch him come into his own identity, which plays into a big chunk of the movie's themes, which we'll get into later. But this isn't just a Miles story, as Haley Steinfeld's Gwen, aka Spider-Woman, is given a lot more backstory and room to pave her own tale of overcoming hardships. Narratively, I think Gwen was the standout for me, as her path to dealing with past trauma and doing what you know is the right thing was quite compelling and really sold the character for me. Then of course, there's the hundreds upon hundreds of spider people present in the film that can't all be possibly talked about. Perhaps the most prominent newcomer is Oscar Isaac's Miguel O'Hara, a militant, futuristic Spider-Man struggling to hold the multiverse together. Miguel's hard-ass demeanor is a stark contrast to the jokier side of the Spider-Man character we've grown accustomed to, giving him believable motives and apparent flaws that allows him to perfectly contrast against Miles. He's a firm believer that very specific things make someone a Spider-Man, and when Miles' entire existence challenges that, it leads to all hell breaking loose. He technically takes on the role of an antagonist halfway through the film, where his actions manage to remain both questionable yet somewhat understandable for someone in his position. Miles' mentor Peter B. Parker also returns in an albeit smaller role, but his presence as an imperfect but well-meaning guide is still warmly received, 
due in no small part to Jake Johnson's endearing performance. As for the rest of the Spider People, we get a few new additions to the cast, including Ben Riley, Spider Bite, Jessica Drew, and my personal favorite, Spider Punk, a fascist-hating rebel who is simply too cool for words, or for one type of animation, apparently, as he has one of the most interesting and intricate designs in the whole movie. Obviously, some of these characters get a bit more play than others. This movie is stuffed with Spider cameos ranging from out-there editions like Spider-Man from the PlayStation games to really out there like Spider-T-Rex. There's even some rather surprising cameos from beyond the world of animation that I won't spoil, but I was genuinely shocked and surprised to see. The last character I want to touch on for now is the Spot, a goofy, bumbling villain that quickly turns into a sinister universe-level threat. I do wish we could have gotten a little bit more of him here, but I like where the film takes him and I can't wait to see how the story continues. Perhaps the most impressive aspect of this film is the wide range of animation styles on display across the two-hour runtime, making each new location and character we come across feel unique and part of a different, realized world. We of course get the familiar Spider-Verse style in Miles' universe, which continues to embrace the comic book and motion aesthetic introduced in the first film, complete with little visual subtleties that make even the most minor motions stylish and impactful. Then there's Gwen's dimension, where the environments are displayed as beautiful watercolor backdrops that melt, bleed, and change color based on the emotions of the scene. Miguel's city of 2099's Nueve York contains the angular, futuristic designs you'd expect, while Spider-Man India's Moonbatten is reflective of 70s era Indian comics, giving the city an almost paper appearance. Even when we aren't in a new world, some characters are given the unique art style treatment to their design, and nowhere is that more apparent than with Spider-Punk. He has this rock and roll magazine cutout design that looks rough around the edges and glued on, obviously emphasizing the punk in Spider-Punk. But the animation team even took it one step further by animating parts of his outfits in different frame rates to make him one of the most unique looking characters in the film. The visual style is so in your face and varied at times that it can be hard to take in all at once. Yet the film isn't just style splashed all over the place. There's intelligent composition at work here that keeps every action set piece visually cohesive and digestible enough. But if you're looking to catch every visual joke or cameo the film throws at you, you might need like three more watch throughs to accomplish that. While the film is heavy on action, it still gives time for the slower, quieter moments that allow characters like Miles and Gwen to really connect with the audience. Occasionally it feels like the pacing grinds to a halt with these scenes, but I believe they're pivotal to understanding the dilemmas and hardships our characters experience that can't be fixed with punching and webbing. Miles' rocky relationship with his parents is both relatable and grounded because you don't really need spider powers to find difficulty in talking to your parents about stress and relationships. Topics like expectations and doing things the way they've always been done are prevalent throughout even tying into Spider-Man mythology specifically. If you're familiar with the lore of Spider-Man and many of his alternate versions, you'll know the path to great power and responsibility is often paved with tragedy and heartbreak. The film spins this into a form of commentary towards the sometimes repetitive nature of comics that ties into what makes Miles stand out, embracing the idea that a hero can come from anywhere and isn't always cut from the same cloth as their predecessors. Admittedly, the way the film approaches this idea can feel a bit silly and convoluted, but the underlying message does manage to come through despite it. If I'm being honest, my serious critiques are few and far between here, at least after the initial viewing. The Spider Society as a whole can sometimes feel a bit forced, especially when you stop to think about how Peter Parker, who makes up a good chunk of the Spider variants, would probably never go along with the values that Miguel holds for the group. I also felt as though the soundtrack this time around didn't have the same punch to it as the first. It's still great, don't get me wrong, it does its job, but there's just not really any memorable integrations with scenes. Sunflower, the Prowler's theme, What's Up Danger? Those moments stuck with me the minute after I experienced them, but nothing like that really happens musically here. The film can also feel like two different stories at times, with the conflict of the first half all but disappearing in the second half. And while it technically ties into what's going on, that story is never really brought to a satisfying conclusion. But like I said, this is but part one of a part two overarching story, so some of the narrative is bound to feel incomplete at times. Yet the cliffhanger the film ends on is undeniably intriguing, and to the film's credit, it does give the character of Gwen a complete arc and an exciting direction to head next. If you thought the first Spider-Verse was for the fans, then you ain't seen nothing yet. The film's many references and visual gags runs the risk of alienating the most common viewer, but these never take away from the fact that the film is still a hell of a good time, brimming with inventive visuals, genuine humor, and a whole lot of heart. 
While I don't think the film is as complete or impactful as the previous film, in my opinion, it still comes pretty damn close, succeeding in areas other animated films could only dream of. Superhero fatigue may still be a lingering sickness, but films like this are a cure if I've ever seen one. For my rating, I'm giving this film four and a half bagels out of five. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Martini Shot. If you saw Across the Spider-Verse, let me know what you thought about it down in the comments. And if you like what you saw here and would like to see more, don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow me across all social media channels. Those links are down in the description below. And if you enjoy movie reviews and movie-themed cocktails, be sure to check out my website, martinishot.blog. Until next time, thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Live deliciously, but please remember to drink responsibly. Thank you.